Hi, everybody. I am trying to get this set up. For our lab today, we are going to be doing reproduction and then I will um, try to get, how do I get this again? Um, all right, so I see that some of you are slowly coming in. All right, so today, again, I'm trying to, how do I pin my video? All right, we are gonna go through the reproduction models first, and then I will try to guide you through what we would have done in class as a rat dissection. Why are you doing that, computer? Okay, my computer is fighting me on some of these items. All right, so we are on the part of the lab manual that is, uh, I think it's page eight on the lab manual where we start with the reproduction system. All right, we're gonna start with the male first. So I'll try to bring these forward, okay? And you can see from an old lab exam, somebody put a sticky right here on the testes and then on the, uh, the blood vessels that and the probably the ductus deferens that's bringing the sperm up and around um, on the back of the bladder to meet up with the urethra. Okay, so um, again, some of the pictures will have to be used for some of the more specific details. Uh, so we'll try the best we can to go over the models, but just remember the pictures from your lab manual in color will also potentially be what you have available to you. All right, so the scrotum. The scrotum is going to be, if I magically move, all right, here is my scrotum. Remember that the scrotum is going to be the ra uh, raphe is the, um, the raised kind of skin, and it is going to contain... It doesn't like to be moved out of the way. It's going to uh, contain both testes. All right. Now, for your layering, remember that the outer layer is the epidermis and the dermis. In the dermis, there will be muscles that are going to give that, again, kind of crinkly appearance of the skin and that are going to have some ability to contract and, again, manipulate this area. Then you're going to get into the hypodermis the cremaster muscle, and then you have what will begin to make that cavity. That will be the tunica vagialis, and then there's a little bit of space, and then the tunica uh, albugina. And remember, the tunica albugina is going to push in and create those chambers that then are going to be where our seminiferous tubules are located. Okay? All right. Uh, it's not real clear on this side, but on this side, you can see the fleshy colored thing here is the epididymis. So here's the testes, the epididymis, and then again, up and around and over. And then you see it as a fleshy looking tube that comes. And here is your uh, first gland, the seminal gland and the ductus deferens or the, uh, the tubing here is going to be right next to it. And it enlarges here and this enlargement area is known as the ampulla, okay? So on this model, all right, again, we see the testes, we see the epididymis, and then that elongating tube, the ductus deferens, all right, and it comes around, and then on this one you can't see it because of the way the, uh, the model is made, but the tube is going back down there and it'll enlarge, and then that will be where our um, seminiferous vesicle and the ampulla are co-located, all right? So if I take these apart, you can kind of see it better here because of the, the rectum doesn't bother it. Here's that seminal vesicle. Here's that ductus deferens. Now, they are going to connect together and the tubing where they connect and the doorway into the urethra is known as the ejaculatory duct, all right? 
And then here again, that trigomy, here's the exit, the internal urethral sphincter. The sphincter then is going to let the urethra start and it's gonna go through the prostate. Remember that's known as our prostate urethra. All right, then it's gonna go through this pelvic floor of muscles and it kind of shows right here the bubble urethro gland. All right, and then the prostate is the third gland. And when the urethra is going through that area, we call it the membrane, I'm sorry, the membraneous urethra. And then here it's going to be surrounded by that very enriching open network meshwork for uh, in, in, uh, engorging with blood and fluid for an erection to happen. And that is known as your uh, corpus cavernosium and your corpus spongiosium. And what I like about these is if I pull them out, you can kind of see, this is the urethra right here. So here's the corpus spongiosium. And then where this pin is, that would be potentially one of our major arteries. It's gonna be surrounded by the corpus cavernosium. And so if I put these together, you have two corpus cavernosiums, one co corpus spongiosium, okay? All right, um, for the external genitalia, again, that is going to be where we associate the penis, all right, and the scrotum. And in the penis, remember the, the uh, prepus is the very opening, the very tip, um, the erectile tissue. Uh, we learned the epididymis. All right, getting in from the epididymis, from the, reddit, uh, from the seminiferous tubules, you'll need to refer to this image. Okay, and remember that you have the seminiferous tubules are collecting sperm and those sperm are making their way up and they're gonna enter into the reddit testes. So the reddit testes is kind of like a funneling and then the reddit testes lets the sperm enter into the epididymis through about 20 doors and those doorways are our efferent ductules. Okay. Um, I think that is everything on here. So external genitalia is the penis and then the head of the penis. Remember that most men in Western culture are uh, circumcised. So if the penis is not engorged and they're not circumcised, there would be excessive skin over here known as the fornix. And that is normally what's burned or cut away to remove, all right? There are, again, in these, uh, in the skin area, remember there are some more milkier glands that are going to produce a little bit of sweat as well as like a creamy mixture. And anytime, again, anytime we have skin that kind of folds over, all right, and that sweat and that goo gets stuck in there, um, if you ever end up doing wound healing or wound or cleaning of people who are um, extremely obese and sedentary, um, you'll have to pick up these folds and clean in between their skin. All right. And if you don't, the skin's more li likely to have issues, abrasions and ulcers and non-healing wounds, and it's going to smell and stink. Um, and so part of that, avoiding that is part of the reason why um, the circumcision occurs. And remember, some of it is related to a religious from the Jews, from that culture um, and, and cleanliness of that. And then others of it is, is it's part of the religious culture, kind of why it happens. OK. Um, all right. And you can kind of see again when you take the penis again, the, the corpus cavernosum, the corpus spongiosum. All right, on this model, again, you see the seminiferous, I'm sorry, the seminal vesicle. And remember, 70% of the semen is coming from here. And they are going to ampulla be where the sperm is collecting. And together, when ejaculation occurs, these two, along with the prostate secretions, are going to join together. That's going to make up most of your ejaculate. The bubble urethral gland, which is, if you can see it, it's a little number five, it is going to create a secretion that is preemptively going to cleanse and flush out any residual acid and uh, urine. And that's going to exit first before the ejaculate comes. Okay, so that's our male reproductive system and our landmarks and our models. For your histology, 
uh, in the testes, in the, uh, uh, in the tubing of the testes, you're going to have, um, you're going, so in the tubing of the testes, you are going to have your spermatogonia, which can, through meiosis, become four sperms. Living inside that tubing with them will be the Sertoli or the nurse cells. And then there'll be some simple squamous epithelia. Okay, I don't have a pen near me. Let me see if I have a marker. Okay, so again, if this is my tubing, okay, I'm gonna try to draw this. And here's my little cell that can become, again, four sperms. Living with that cell will be my nurse cell. Okay, and then again, I'll have lots of these spermatogonia cells that when they divide, one of them can become a sperm making cell, one of them will remain. Okay, and in this tube, I am going to have again those nurse cells, and I'm going to have a layer of cells, a little simple squamous epithelium that's going to wrap around and somewhat make this tube an entity of protected cells from this external environment, all right? Now, in this external environment, okay, I am gonna have cells that live in here, and the cells that live in this external environment, some of them are gonna be my Leydig cells, and remember those Leydig cells, okay, they're shown kind of in this picture, all right? They are going to be the ones that produce the testosterone, okay? And some of that testosterone is gonna jump over and influence the nerve cells and the spermatogonia to go through maturation and meiosis and mitosis. Uh, but most of that, again, testosterone is trying to get into the bloodstream, okay? So there is a connective tissue environment. There's blood vessels here. Then there's a little bit of a separation and it's showing you in these different images that is some simple squamous epithelium. And then inside those tubules are going to be a mixture of these cells going through mitosis, cells going through meiosis, and then the nurse cells supporting, supporting them. And remember those nurse cells are gonna make inhibin so they can kind of, again, watch FSH inhibin and the sperm cell count numbers. And then they'll also create some of the binding proteins for testosterone. Um, so that way testosterone as a fat and a steroid molecule has the ability to bind and be in the watery enriched environment. Okay. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So again, the seminiferous tubules has this rich layer of germinal epithelium cells that are undergoing meiosis and mitosis that's full of spermatogonia, spermocytes, and our nurse cells. Our interstitial or latex cells are gonna be more on the outside in the connective tissue regions, okay? Our spermatogonia, our sperm cells, are gonna have a head, a neck, and a tail. And in the head, there will be some uh, kind of enzymes to help create a breakthrough uh, to get into the egg. So that way the genetic material that's in this part of the head can reach and be merged into a new entity. Uh, there's going to be a lot of mitochondria in this neck region. There's going to be some stored glucose and fructose. And then the tail is going to be made up of some intracellular proteins. And you, you need to go back and read about them if you want, um, about how cilia beats. Well, this is how a flagella beats. It's made up of actin and myosin type proteins, microfilament proteins. And then again, when energy is present, they're going to be able to whip. All right. And remember, if we take these sperm out of the seminiferous tubules and try to inject them, they're not ready to uh, fertilize an egg. It takes, again, the time it takes to get to become a sperm here, the sperm then gets put into the epididymis. The epididymis then gets it through there. It gets through the ductus deferens. It gets to the ampulla. So it can take about two weeks, potentially, for this cell to form and then be ready to be activated and then turned on for swimming purposes and then get into a position where it can actually then fertilize an egg, okay? All right, uh, moving to our female anatomy, all right? So again, uh, for our female anatomy, remember that the ovary, all right, the suspensory ligament is gonna be um, over here. The uh, 
what do you call it? The ovarian ligament over here. The mesovarium is over here, all right? And it's staying supported. Then you have your uterine tube. And remember your uterine tube has the infundibulum and the infundibulum has the little finger-like fembrae projections that are kind of wrapping around to catch anything that would be shot out of the ovary. The turn here and the middle region is known as the ampulla. And then our region that connects to the uterus is known as our uh, isthmus, okay? Um, the ovary is going to have a cortex, all right? And the tunica albuginea would be that nice connective tissue kind of covering. And then right below it is going to be some simple columnar cells. And then we're gonna to start to see those follicles. And remember those follicles are gonna have the ovum, the oocyte, the cell that's gonna to have to go through meiosis, okay? And it's gonna be surrounded by a single layer of supporting cells and it's arrested. It's not doing anything until FSH comes down and pushes the supporting cells to turn on. And then the supporting cells will start going through mitosis. They're gonna divide, divide, divide. They're gonna create estrogen. They're gonna create inhibin. They're gonna create a layer around the, um, the ovum, the primary oocyte and that zona pellucidia. And then one more layer kind of around the margin of the entire follicle. So that way I can again, start to see the follicle go into primary follicle state secondary follicle state and then one of them is going to start to again get a little bit of a head like in a race and is going to start to like secrete molecules that tell the other follicles to arrest to stop producing to stop converting to stop growing and cycle back into program cell death all right and be reabsorbed by the system okay um, the medulla of the ovary is going to be where the blood vessels are. And again, that's where, again, our FSH is coming in, our LH is coming in, our inhibin is going out, and our estrogen can go out because remember, they're all hormones. So they're going to use the blood supply to be able to enter and exit. All right. Uh, it's not a great picture. All right. So here's the pelvis uh, bone. Um, the bladder is, again, underneath the uterus sits a little antro uh, anterior flex and then here's the rectum all of this is on midline the ovaries are off midline okay um for the uterine tubes there's going to continuously be simple columnar epithelium with cilia so those cells are going to beat again to try to initially bring the egg and the sperm close together so they can fertilize and the egg finishes meiosis too. That's usually in the ampulla, all right? And then the isthmus, again, if that fertilization happens, the, the uh, embryo now, as it's going through its first mitosis, one cell becomes two, its second mitosis, two cell becomes four, its third mitosis and four cells become eight and making its way to the uterus, the simple columnar epithelium and any peristalsis of the muscular layer are trying to prevent that embryo from implanting in this tube, which would then lead to an etopic pregnancy, okay? You can also look at these landmarks on the picture here uh, of the ovary and again of your uterus, okay? Uh, I think we got almost everything listed on this page. All right, so again, turn the page. The ovary is just, it's a, uh, a pouch. If... Okay, some of the additional things. All right, so for the uterus, all right, if we open our uterus and we look, the white layer, all right, is going to be our endometrium. And it kind of shows that a little bit of this pink layer might be some of the endometrium as well. And the white layer would represent what estrogen tells to grow. And as estrogen grows, it thickens up. And then progesterone would tell it to become slimy and slick and, and, and uh, sticky. All right. And then when progesterone goes away at the end of the uh, lute luteal phase of the ovarian cycle, then this is sloughed off, and this then becomes what is bled out during menenses. 
okay? Um, all right, the other part of this is there's a nice big muscle layer. You kind of see it red with the, with the red drops here and there. And then you see a little bit of an outside layer. And that outside layer on the top Remember that our pelvic floor is down here. So the bottom down here is gonna be an adventitia. But this very top could be still the peritoneal membrane sitting right here and then kind of folding over um, to that region. So some of the external features of the, again, perimetrium, the outer part of the uterus can be that visceral and parietal peritoneal membrane. And then the areas where it's tucked in and hidden and not the peritoneum, it can just be an adventitia, okay? Uh, the part, again, looking at that big thick muscle layer. So the opening that's the most interior opening, that is going to be the internal os and the one out here is the external os. And then you have a little bit of a tunnel. This external part of the uterus that points out into the vagina, that is going to be your cervix, okay? And I'm trying to double check, I don't say this wrong. Um, but there is a little bit of this indentation here and indentation there, and I don't see it listed on items you have to know. So maybe I don't ask that question when it comes to the uterus. The fund, uh, no, the fundus is the main body. Fundus, body, cervix. Okay, so I don't see the, the name listed. No, the fornix. Okay, so the little indentations here. So it's kind of like um, if you close the door, the little gap that's made between the door and the wall, that's the fornix. Okay? Okay, I think the vagina is then going to be this area to here. And the vagina is going to have, again, a mucosa that is stratified squamous epithelium. It's gonna have lots of hills and valleys and that material is stretchable. So that is why we're gonna call that the rugae, okay? Uh, blah, blah, blah. I think we're moving along quite well, all right? And then when we get to the vagina, when you're looking at it, if I can get this thing. All right, here is your external female genitalia. All right, if and when, ah, okay. If and when the vagina has still a covering over it, that would be if the female still had a hymen, okay? For your external genitalia, again, our plastic models don't really show this, but the vulva, all right, is this area. Here's that mons pubis with that nice fat pad and again, this would be where pubic hair would grow. Um, you have your labia majoras, and then when you open them, there's the labia minora, okay? So the major lips and the minor lips. Um, you have the, uh, in the clitoris, it'll be located in a more anterior position. Remember the clitoris would be somewhat of the penis if the penis had developed in the female. And one of the things about the clitoris is in women that take excess testosterone because maybe they're bodybuilders, that clitoris will actually grow and they have described it as being like the size of the tip of your pinky finger. So it can get prolonged growth, again, under excessive testosterone influence, okay? Um, the vestibule, again, is the opening. And then you can kind of see them listed here. There are, here's that labia majora, their skin and off midline, there are glands that are around this area that can secrete into that labia majora, labia minora area, all right? And they're shown right here uh, the greater vestibulo gland, all right, with is also known as Bartholin's gland, okay? Um, so they're located on that side, embedded here. And remember, they're going to be some of the glands that the men have, but they're on the urethra. Well, in the women, that didn't develop and externally grow, so those glands instead tucked in and became part of this area, all right? 
And then here's your perineum and then here's the anus. Okay, so trying to give you that landmark. All right, uh, I did not grab any breast tissue. So for the most part, the breast tissue will be on the picture. All right, and so again, you have the nipple is the pointy area, the dark rounded circle around it is the nipple. Uh, you are gonna have these lobes, okay? And you're gonna see that there's some suspensory ligaments that are going to help, again, as the breast tissue grows out and starts to hang, that are trying to help keep it suspended. Then each little ball is going to be a lobule, all right? And inside each of those lobules, you are gonna see that they are connecting into a series of tubing, and those tubings are going to uh, connect into each other. So everywhere there's a little doorway opening, those are the lactiferous ducts. All right, and then where there's some enlargements and it's waiting and holding that fluid before it exits out the, the holes of the, of the, um, in the areola region, those will be your lactiferous sinuses, okay? All right, so those are the major landmarks that we have. Now comes time to dissect our lovely little rat, all right? Now, for our rat, you are going to have one picture, and you are going to see in the picture, the goal is to identify some of the major organs that we've covered this semester, all right? So, most of the organs that we've covered this semester, we've covered the heart, right? So, over here on the left, we've covered the lungs, then we've covered the trachea, the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, the two kidneys, which will be more back here, and then eventually our, uh, our reproductive glands. Most of the time when I dissect out my rats, I destroy or I don't get very good views of our um, reproductive glands, so we probably won't be able to see that. Um, but we will get to see some of the other features and landmarks, all right? So if we were to try to do a rat surgery where we wanted him to wake up, we would try to do a thoracotomy. So we would try to cut under this little arm into this region, all right? And we would try to find, again, there's the muscle layer. We would try to find, ah, whoo, he smells. You are lucky you're not having to smell this, okay? We would try to find, again, uh, his ribs, and then we would try to open in between those ribs, and we would try to get to his heart, all right? And we would try to produce or do our surgery, then close him up and leave him to wake up when the anesthesia wears off and his only little surgical implement is right there. All right. If you're going to do some type of other surgery or you would might have to open him and this is how your dissection material usually has you do is open him through the belly. All right. And I'm going to rinse him out. So just stand by for a second. By rinsing him out, I kind of get rid of some of the smell for my purposes, right? And I, uh, I help also clear him out. All right, so I'm going to just cut this away so you can have better access, all right? Again, if I was going to try to wake him up, I probably wouldn't cut all this away, but we're not waking this guy up, okay? And then I'll cut over this way to get him more open. All right, now these guys pre-death, they were injected with red and green dye to try to get into their veins and their arteries to better show you those landmarks, okay? So in this here, whoop, as I throw that away, okay? The liver is going to, again, 
be rich in two thirds of its blood supply are going to be the uh, the venous blood. So this is the liver right in here, and there's one, two, three, four lobes. Okay, here's this little J pouch stomach, right? And this little guy right here, he's kind of long and skinny, and in the rats they kind of tuck under. This is his spleen. Okay, so spleen stomach and then these little lobular livers and then look at this kidney you can tell all the dye the red and green dye quite a bit of it ended up in the kidney okay uh, the kidney over here did not get quite as much of that red and green dye okay uh, so it's over here all right so those would be potential things that i could ask you again uh kidney spleen stomach liver and then here's the other liver this most of this is small intestines mixed into large intestines uh here's some of our reproductive organs i only have like five minutes left so i want to make sure i get into the chest up here here's the you can kind of see the diaphragm right it's this thin muscle uh, and then when i open this guy up okay it's really hard, but this is his uh, this is his heart, and then his lungs are more here. And I think I cut into one of his lungs, or I cut something uh, when I was trying to get to his heart. So it's kind of a hot mess, all right. And then if I was to want to give him a thoracotomy or get into his uh, try to get into his trachea, all right, you can kind of see they have a little bit more muscle right here. And I don't know if you can really see it very well, but inside here, and I'm trying to get him out so you can see it, I have my probe, or I'm trying to get my probe. There is, ah, can you even see it? There is right there, and if you feel it where my finger's rubbing, that's his trachea, okay? So um, it was really quick and dirty, trachea, the esophagus would be behind it, heart, lungs, liver, there's one kidney, other kidney back here, here's the spleen, small intestines, some of the bigger pieces would be the large intestines, and then you can kind of see for this guy here, some of his uh, seminiferous uh, glands, some of his reproductive components. All right, let me... Uh, Pull you guys back up. We are about to run out of time. Um, does anyone have any questions before we call it a day and say goodbye? Whew, he smells. I have a quick question. All right, gang, if you don't have any questions, hopefully that helped you again. Review your major glands, remove re that, review your major landmarks, review your major histological components, and look at the rat and see how I could potentially, in a picture, and of course in a picture, hopefully there's better color and better orientation. You're looking for that diaphragm, anything above the diaphragm, think about heart, lungs, and in the neck, the trachea, those are things I could potentially try to get in a picture to put a pin in. Uh, in, the, in the abdominal pelvic, usually the big things are the liver, the stomach, the spleen, again, is going to be kind of wrapped around and under, and then I would have to kind of really pull stuff out of the way to get to the, uh, to the kidneys, all right? So have a great day. Uh, I will see you guys Monday. Remember, Monday, we have another lecture over the quiz. Tomorrow's our last lecture and last chance for questions. So if you have any last minute questions before you take your quiz, before you get ready to take finals, before you get ready to take lab and every last lecture, uh, remember tomorrow's our last big lecture for that opportunity. Monday's lecture is over the quiz that you take over the weekend and then we're done and all we have is lecture test, lab test, final exam. Voice threads are due. Don't, don't forget, there's an opportunity to earn two bonus points. Give me a good video that reviews some of this material. Uh, and then don't forget, what else? Uh, your last lab on that ADILT website. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow and Monday.